right here in Indianapolis. It's Brigham Young. And here we have Jonathan Hoyer. That pass that right? Hewer. Hewer from Ball State University. Cam Kramer teaches at IU Bloomington and also does work for K-12 here in Indianapolis. And then we also have Mark Fisher from Dwayne Morris from Boston, Massachusetts. So thank you very much and welcome. I expect, expect a very, very lively, robust debate because we do have a lot of divergent views here. You know, we are talking about capitalism on one hand and education on the other. And we're dealing with a product that a lot of people, a lot of agencies and organizations are involved in because we are dealing with a thing called money. Money generated by intellectual property. Uh, as it has been noted many times by many writers, broadband has the potential to enable improvements in public education through e-learning and online content. It's argued that e-learning and online content can provide more personalized learning opportunities for our students. From this, it follows that broadband can facilitate the flow and the access of information 24-7, helping teachers, parents, schools, and other organizations to make better decisions that are relevant to each student's needs and their abilities. To meet these ends, the National Broadband Plan includes three recommendations, and these are on your handout. From pages 248 to 249, this is recommendation 11.4. Congress should consider taking legislative action to encourage. I don't know how legislation can be crafted to encourage. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> legislative action to encourage copyright holders to grant educational digital rights of use without prejudicing their other rights. How do you do that? Well, they want to update the TEACH Act. Uh, I deal with the TEACH Act at the beginning of every semester. Lots of confusion. Lots of binding powers in that TEACH Act. And I think what they, what they, try, to, what, what they try to want to do, I think, from my, from my understanding of what, they're, what they've been writing about, is they want to open up some more face-to-face -face freedom. We don't have that in the distance education classroom if you're able to teach. Very, very restrictive. Uh, a new copyright notice, besides the little C with a circle around it, that all powerful one ring that rules them all, we have this new proposal, the little E with a circle around it. We already have another one too. Anybody know what that other little, little letter with a circle around it is? It's a P, yeah. Yeah, no. P. Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about. Kind of but that has to do with what? Phonograms, recordings. So they want to institute a third one and facilitate licensing. Uh, at the educational level, licensing is a pain. I don't know how they help to facilitate licensing when we're involved with money, and especially a lot of vendors and a lot of copyright owners who are locked in to a pricing scheme. Uh, for example, ASCD, a particular group that puts out educational materials, I tried to license one of their 19-minute videos. It was going to be $900 for one-time use for a distance education class of 22 folks. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, recommendation 15.7 from page 322. Congress should consider amending the Copyright Act to provide for copyright exemptions to public broadcasting organizations for online broadcast and distribution of public media. Recommendation 15.9, Congress should consider amending the Copyright Act to enable public and broadcast media to more easily contribute their archival content to a digital national archive and grant reasonable non-commercial downstream usage rights for this content to the American people. Well, with these two recommendations, there's a couple problems. First of all, public broadcasting, do they produce a lot of materials? No, they're distributors. And the government is proposing, through uh, this legis proposed legislation effort, to get a thing called video.gov, where all these public domain 
and those folks who want to contribute their copyrighted material to can be used for educational purposes. But did you notice something here that's more or less given just a tip of the hat? But in, in reality, it's not really addressed, in my view, or it's merely just shrugged off. Uh, the answer to that rhetorical question is, it's leaking out owner's rights. Ownership. So when it comes to intellectual property, there are, at the most basic level, just two sides. Simplistically, I offer this. One side wants to have royalties for the use of intellectual property every time IP is used, no matter what the use, no matter what the reason. The other side, on the other hand, has the grandiose perception that they can actually use someone else's copyrighted material for, of all things, education. You know, without any cost at all. Obama has a liking to dealing with the upcoming November election results as being in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So with that metaphor in mind, our battle lines are drawn. Owners versus users. Another way of looking at it too, <clears throat> the extreme ends, it's greed versus need. Those who want to make money, opposed to those who want to be able to take that copyrighted material for educational purposes. Owners versus users. So we are now ready to commence the most controversial, the most contentious, and the most pugilistic panel of the conference. Copyright, education, and the national broadband plan. Does that little C equal that little E with a circle around it? Got a couple questions on your handout. We're going to be starting off with on page two, the last bullet point. Does the new educational copyright symbol, that's that little bit of a circle around it, make sense for users and owners? U.S. education is failing. Won't this wider access to free materials enhance U.S. education? Well, Chris, uh, maybe to start, um, I have a yeah. I don't think we need this notice. Um, all we would need to do to handle this kind of licensing is do what people in other settings have done, open source licensing, creative commons licensing. Seems like a good idea to have a symbol identifying rights, but this is something on a private basis could be handled if people in different constituencies wanted. To the extent I understand the proposal, it's pretty broad, um, it would be a kind of license. So that's appropriately the kind of thing copyright owners should be able to do or not do unless it's a compulsory license, which I don't think is a proposal, in which case a whole other set of rules apply. So I think a private license, a long line of Creative Commons, would achieve the same thing. Again, it's a compulsory license where the government is imposing um, a fee and licensing structure. That's a whole different um, discussion, but I'm not sure there is a need. There is a need to change um, distance education. There is a need to change public broadcasting rights that are very limited and don't really reflect the digital age, but I'm not sure there's a need for a government licensing program as opposed to providing specific exemptions. I would agree with that, actually. Um, and, and, and I think one of the issues is, and I don't, can you hear me now? Um, 